Okay. All right, it looks like we're rolling. So, uh, welcome everyone to the UVM Extension New Farmer Project webinar, a CSA primer. I'm Jessie Schmidt and I work with the UVM Extension New Farmer Project and the Women's Ag Network and I'll be moderating this evening. Uh, we have three great presenters joining us this evening. Jean Hamilton is uh, the Northeast Organic Farming Association of Vermont's Marketing, Development and Consumer Access Coordinator and she also works with Vermont Food Education Every Day, Vermont Feed. Um, NOFA provides great technical assistance and marketing opportunities to community supported agricultural programs throughout the state, um, including an online program directory. They also organize the annual direct marketing conference and offer fire, farm viability consultations. Additionally, NOFA hosts the Vermont Farm Share Program and the Senior Farm Share Program, which subsidizes CSA shares for low income Vermonters. They also conduct an annual CSA survey to track statewide CSA market trends and needs. Um, Joe Buley will present second, and he is from Screaming Ridge Farm and sells retail wholesale, and recently through a CSA, he developed with fellow farmer George Gross. The Central Vermont Food Hub is a multi-farm CSA model that brings a variety of fresh and prepared local foods to customers. And Krista Alexander um, will be our third pre presenter. She started Jericho Settlers Farm in 2002. She and her partner raised vegetables, pork, lamb, beef, chicken, and eggs, and they recently expanded their CSA to a year-round model and include products from other farms. So welcome, Jean, Joe, and Krista. We're really psyched to have you here this evening. And Jean, I'll let you take it away. Okay, great, thanks. Um, it's really excellent to see so many people on the call and people from all over the country. It's really exciting to have this opportunity to speak with you all and I, I'm I'm basically just going to give an introduction to CSA um, and introduce some of the innovations that we're seeing in the state but I, I want to move kind of quickly through my presentation because I think you all will um, get so much from hearing from the great farmers who are presenting next. So um, I'll just start by introducing myself again. I'm Jean Hamilton and I work with NOFA Vermont. You'll see on the slide, that's our um, logo. We, we're a statewide organization that's been around for just about 40 years. And um, this is our, our mission statement is, is that we're working to promote an economically viable and ecologically sound Vermont food system for the benefit of current and future generations. So we do a lot of programming to support farmers. Um, as Jesse said, my, my program area is really in market development. So I do a lot of work with CSAs, but also farmers markets and farm stands and uh, low-income outreach programs and, and farm to school too. So um, I know that a lot of the farmers that are on the call from Vermont participate in a lot of those different different programs and it's fun to see some familiar names up there. But um, for the names I don't recognize, I'd love to um, hear or see from you with green checks how many of you have participated in CSAs before and uh, that participation might have taken the form of being a customer in a CSA or uh, an apprentice on a farm that managed a CSA or maybe you've managed your own CSA. Um, so just to get a sense of what the level of exposure to CSA is, okay, I'm seeing a half so far. Um, and also I think it's, it's uh, these webinar programs, it's, it's kind of fun to use these different tools. So. Um, so jump right in there and, and let's see those green checks. Okay, great. So a couple of people new to CSA. Um, the other thing I'd love to hear is um, just to invite you all to type in questions into the chat box. So if there are particular things you're hoping to learn on this call, um, you know, as much guidance as you can give us about your interest areas, um, we can better serve you. So feel free to just type those in at any point, but right now would be a great point to, to just type in some polls you have for the webinar um, in the chat box. And I saw a hand raised. Um, I think whoever raised their hand, if, if you have a question, I think you could just go ahead and, and um, type that in the chat box. Um, Okay, so you know I won't talk too much about CSA because I think a lot of you are familiar with it, but uh, basically CSA stands for Community Supported Agriculture and it came to the states in, in the 80s. Um, the person who's really attributed with bringing it here is Robin Van N. Um, and my understanding is that the concept really uh, arose concurrently 
um, in Japan and Switzerland. So there's there's not clear um, history on on whether it was first in Japan or first in Switzerland, but either way, it might have been one of those um, simultaneous evolutions. Um, and really, it was founded, I think, in both cases by consumers who were interested in securing a um, steady source of food that they wanted to eat. So especially in the Japanese model, my understanding is that people, a, a group of consumers actually got together and, and um, proposed this model to some local farmers. Um, so it's interesting to note that, that the historical roots of CSA are really driven by the community and um, versus, you know, I, I would say most CSA programs we see today, which are primarily farmer driven. Um, What's so fascinating about CSA is that it's taking so many different forms now. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with the kind of traditional model in which consumers pay upfront, usually in the springtime, for a set number of boxed um, shares that they pick up on a weekly basis from the farm. Um, that, that's pretty much the most traditional model. And, and originally, when CSA first came to the States, it was very much um, a concept of working membership was was also really integrated into the, the share program. So in addition to paying for the shares, most members would in some way support the, the farm through um, volunteer time, whether that was in the field or maybe keeping books or doing marketing. So here um, on this slide, I, I just have a little table with some different um, evolutions we're seeing. So. The pre-selected shares, you know, now we're seeing more and more free choice, whether that means um, people just go down a line and kind of pick up whether they like kale or salad greens, um, or even a farm, kind of the farm stand um, debit card model, which is coming up where people buy a debit card um, that they can use at a farm stand or farmer's market or wherever else the farm is selling. We're also seeing some differences in whether there's a farm pickup or a home or work site delivery. Again, that issue of working shares, are people required to work on the farm or invited to? Um, and then more and more, we're seeing different farms coming together and really providing a, a very diverse CSA share through um, you know, being able to provide vegetables and fruits and, and meats and eggs and all different kinds of things. So before I go on, I'm just going to check out the chat box and review this really quickly. Okay. Great. So a lot of things about collaborative CSAs and year-round CSAs, which is just what Joe and Krista will be talking about. So I'll keep going on. Um, a lot of farms jump into CSA when they're first getting started uh, because it, it sort of seems like an accessible market for people who are just getting started and don't have relationships with grocery stores or restaurants. And um, in many cases, that's, it is a great place to start. But I, you know, before starting any new venture, I think it's really valuable for everyone to consider um, you know, whether or not this model will really work for you. And, and CSA is a very particular model. It, it is very consumer-oriented. Um, and tends to have a lot of involvement with the customers, a lot of interaction. And that's you know, something that many CSA farmers see as a great benefit. Um, but if, for instance, you don't enjoy directly interacting with your customers on a regular basis, then that might be a distinct um, drawback of CSA. So before embarking on any new market venture, I, I really encourage um, farmers to, to really do a kind of pros and cons list to, to consider what they um, would enjoy about CSA and what they wouldn't. And, and of course, with all these new models of CSA coming out, there, you know, there are many opportunities to, to tweak the model to fit your um, interests and growing possibilities. So these are, these are just some guiding questions that hopefully you'll consider if you're just getting started with CSA or even if you've, you've done CSA for a couple of years. You know, these are great questions to, to help reflect on whether or not the your program is, is meeting your needs and, and really is acting as optimally as possible for your members. Um, so um, I 
here are some of the innovations that we're seeing right now. Of course, uh, this multi-farm CSA concept is um, really exciting, and, and we're seeing it in, in a lot of different ways. So in some cases, the multi-farm concept is really driven by one farm who's sort of acting as a buyer from different producers. And in other ways, I, I think, like Joe's model, it's really a number of different farms coming together um, to form one CSA. Uh, another great model we're seeing is this workplace or school-based CSAs, which um, are so, I think, one of the most exciting growth potential for CSA, particularly in Vermont. Um, and, you know, a lot of employers are, are really excited about including CSAs as an employee benefit or, or at least giving employees a, a voucher for a reduced price CSA. And it, it's a really great way to integrate some health um, components into the workplace and also a great way for farmers to have a bit of a captive audience um, and, and hopefully deliver a bunch of shares all at once. Um, another model that I've seen that's, that's working really well to augment CSA uh, sales and also the, the success of CSAs is integrating on-farm events. So whether or not your CSA does pickups on the farm, um, on-farm events are, are really a nice way to integrate consumers more deeply into your CSA, which I think most CSA farmers agree is one of the best things about CSA. Is it really is an opportunity for consumers not just to buy directly from the farmer, but to become even more involved than they might be if they're just shopping at the farmer's market or the farm stand, and, and to really get to know the farmer possibly through weekly newsletters or farm visits and, and really understand more what um, what it takes to grow the food and, and how the food comes to be available to them. Um, the Market Basket is a really cool program that, well, there are a few models of this, but one great model is in Brattleboro coming out of Coast Oil Solutions um, where they've basically integrated a CSA and, and farmer's market into a, a sort of unified concept um, where people can either pre-buy a CSA share or just shop at the farmer's market. And it's quite small, just three or four vendors. Um, or they can pick up a CSA share and then also buy additional products. And their model is, is particularly targeting low-income shoppers. So they, they do have a sliding scale fee for their shares, which is a nice way to um, for producers to really meet the community needs. Also, along the lines of um, low income access, things like the Farm Share Program um, or other subsidy programs are a great way to pull in a new market sector into your CSA. Our program um, supports 50 or half, half of the cost of a CSA share through a kind of creative cost share model in which um, the farmer fundraises 25% of the total share cost from their members we contribute 25% and then the low income consumer pays half price. Um, and there are some different models like this um, starting up around the country. I know Just Food in um, New York City has a great model and, and I imagine there are lots of others. So that's a great thing to jump in here. If you have seen other low income outreach models that you'd like to share, that might be a nice thing to share in the chat box. Um, another example of, of that is SNAP, which is the new name for what used to be called the Food Stamp Program. More and more CSA programs are exploring the opportunity of, of integrating SNAP or food stamps um, as a payment option into their shares. Um, and then finally, this year-round CSA, which I think is such an exciting opportunity to, to again, further develop that relationship between the consumer and farmer. In the models I've seen, you know, it just really draws the consumer into, into close relationship with the farm and understanding what, about the seasonality of the farm and the various practices the farm uses. So uh, I'm really excited to hear Krista talk about that. So um, that is pretty much what I planned to cover, though I'm, I'm really happy to um, address questions now or at the end. Jesse, I'm not quite sure how you wanted to do that. Um, I will just direct you. This link is to our website where we um, have a, a lot of information about CSA. Um, so if you just 
I think I'll just leave this slide up for a second so that you can you can either copy it out and, and visit it at another time or go browse around there now. Um, Jesse, do I have time to answer a couple questions? Yeah, I think so. And, and one just came up that I was going to ask myself, which is if you could explain a little bit more how people are using SNAP, using the EBT cards to pay for CSAs. Do you know how farmers are, are making that work? for um, those budgets and um, with those systems? Yes, um, and Carol, I'll just, and everyone else who's interested there, we do have a resource guide up on our website, so for more a more complete picture, feel free to go there or to email or call me. I'm, I'm really happy to talk with you about this. Um, basically, the process for setting up EBT access at CSA, um, you, you have to go through the USDA Food and Nutrition Service and become an approved vendor which is um, it's a free process, and it's not terribly cumbersome, but it is somewhat federally <laughs> bureaucratic. So our resource guide kind of steps you through that um, and tries to make it as easy as possible. Um, the important thing to know about using SNAP um, benefits for CSA is that people can only buy one week worth of food at a time with their EBT card. And just to back up for a second, EBT stands for Electronic Benefit Transfer Card. It's basically a debit style card that carries SNAP and other um, welfare benefits. So for most farms, for any farm that is not a um, registered nonprofit, you can only charge for one week of shares at a time. Um, and that's really to meet these guidelines that the FNS sets that, that um, SNAP participants are getting the amount of food that they're paying for and they're not um, you know, participating in any risk with their benefits. So that shared risk, shared bounty model of the CSA does not line up particularly well with, um, with SNAP users. But, um, so that's an important thing to know. If your farm is registered as a 501c3, you can charge for up to two weeks at a time. Um, so, other, so once you've gotten FNS approved and you have set up a system for your farm of, you know, that you're going to be okay with charging on a weekly basis to your SNAP customers, um, there are a couple options. You can either get an electronic card reader, um, wired or wireless, to read the cards and transmit the funds directly from the, the participant's SNAP account into your bank account or you can use a paper voucher system where basically you use the telephone, you tell a bank um, to secure the funds, and then you send in a voucher with an imprint um, of the card number to confirm that, um, that the SNAP participant did get that share. So um, just quickly, the wireless machine is great if you don't have electricity or telephone access at your CSA pickups. Um, the unfortunate thing about wireless is that the machines are, can be quite expensive and they do have monthly service and transaction fees. Wired machines are sort of the best option if you have access to a landline and electricity because um, you can get a free machine from the USDA via your state SNAP office um, and the USDA will cover all of the service and transaction fees. And then the paper voucher, also there are no transaction fees and there's no fee for buying the vouchers. The only problem is, is you have to call in the transaction, um, which if you're at a very busy CSA pickup can be cumbersome. Um, and then you have to send in the voucher, which I, you know, is not too cumbersome, but is something that you have to remember to do. I do know, Jean, that a few uh, farmers um, have accepted payments through farmers market machines. Um, machines at farmers markets um, have accepted payments there for weekly pickups of CSA shares. I'm not sure if that's uh, kosher, but um, that's another way uh, to get access to um, that service that I've heard of. Yes, that is um, what we'd say officially against the rules, but oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's um, you know it's something that uh, I think probably makes sense for some people to do, and um, you know is we'll leave it at that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. Well, thanks, 
Jean. And if uh, people come up with more questions as they go along for Jean, she is going to stay um, in the presentation here so uh, we can ask more questions um, as we go along. Um, and I think we're ready for Joe. Okay. I'm assuming you can all hear me. You sound great. All right. Not too sleepy. Um, my name is Joe Buley, and I am one of the primary farmers growers for the Central Vermont Food Hub. It's a CSA model we started this past summer. My partner is Dog River Farms, and it's um, kind of unique in a lot of ways, I guess. My farm comprises about, I've got about a total of two acres in tillage. That's including greenhouses. And then my partner has about 60 acres in tillage. And so I have a tendency, we, it works very well for the two of us since I focus quite a bit on value added products. Um, the CSA model is more of a collaborative model. We've got a total of about 15 different producers or other growers right now that we buy in their product. We're on a schedule. We started with a summer CSA this year. We ran it from June until about the third week in September with a planned two-month break. And then we're going to roll into a winter CSA, which will run from November 17th until the end of March, but that will be a delivery every other week. So it's only 10 deliveries as opposed to, I think, 16 during the summer. But we'll double up the share contents during the winter months. Um, my partner and I are the primary produce growers for the CSA. And then we're buying in um, a lot of locally produced items. We work primarily just in Washington County. So we're supporting or developing a market for Washington County producers and growers. We really have no intent of going beyond that. We think we have enough or a large enough market to support what we would like to do just here in the county. Um, so some quick numbers were we started on the fly this spring and we sold out and we took 110 members and we're about to close up our winter membership and we're going to be at about 100 members for that as well. So we think we're doing fairly well given our first season. Kind of a unique aspect of what we're up to is a very big customer service and convenience driven component. If we have five members at a work site, we will deliver to that work site. So this past summer, we had 110 members, and 45 of them would go to the farm stand at Dog River to do the typical pickup at the farm. And 65 of our members, 70 of our members, were all workplace drop-off sites. And so we ended up with approximately 12 drop sites in the Washington County area um, this year. So while we're creating a market for our own produce, we're also creating a market for other vendors in the area and helping them aggregate that product out into Washington County. Um, let's see. Marketing, what we've been focusing on is a lot of social media. So we have a Facebook page, a blog site. We do Twitter. Um, we Obviously, we have a website up. Um, we link all of that. We publish frequently to the blog. Dog River Farm and myself both participate in the Montpelier Farmers Market, so we're doing marketing there at the Farmers Market at least every week. Um, we're doing a lot of cold calling to larger corporate accounts places like Blue Cross Blue Shield, National Life. Uh, we're finding that a lot of the human resources departments from a health insurance perspective are becoming very, very interested in what they're calling wellness programs, preventative maintenance. And so we're finding some of these large institutions are interested in supporting their employees 
um, zero interest payment plan or even to the extent that they're subsidizing a certain percentage of the cost of the share. So that's worked out really well. Um, we have a big, we're probably doing about 50% value added product. It's, we've set the price at just one set price. So for that price you're getting bread, eggs, one week you'll have ground beef, following week you may have a locally produced uh, tempeh. Um, so we're not, I guess, for lack of a better term, nickel and diming our customers to death. So that, oh, if you want eggs, that's an egg share. If you want pesto, that's a pesto share. It's much more like a typical grocery cart when you walk out. There's a little bit of everything in there. Um, from value-added products, stuff that's ready to eat, it's all made from local ingredients, to a certain amount of product that still requires the member to do some cooking and get in the kitchen and be a little bit creative. And we're supporting that creative aspect with a weekly blog post whenever there's a share being uh, distributed. So we've got recipes, things that are pertinent to that week. What else? Logistics have been really tough, um, trying to keep track of all these people. We try to honor a fair amount of dietary requests. Again, it comes back to my spending 25 years in the restaurant industry. We've got a pretty big commitment to customer service to trying to do what the customers want without letting things get a little bit too crazy for us. We have developed a payment plan. We've dabbled with online credit card payment for the summer share. And we stopped that. We're going to have to just revisit it because the uh, credit card companies were just taking too much money, holding money in a reserve account, so on and so forth. We're actually looking at taking credit card payment over an iPhone with just a quick swipe card or being able to punch the credit card number in. That'll run right through QuickBooks, which will download into our accounting program. So the logistics there, bookkeeping, collecting money, keeping track of things, we're looking at a couple of different types of software to do that as well. We've also instituted a payment plan. A lot of our customers, especially with the economy right now, are choosing to make two or three individual payments broken up over a few months. Um, I think that's helped drive our sales this year. It's still a fairly large amount of money for people up front. Um, what else? Let's see. The collaborative model. Uh, let's picture the blog up. We post there. Drop sites are posted over here to the right side. We're trying to drive our membership to communicate via the blog so that we are reaching everybody instead of having to send spam link emails out and then people's spam filters um, basically kick them into the garbage can. Uh, and I've got a question from Carol Tashi. How much are our shares and do we do different sizes? Um, our shares for this summer for $525, a winner share is going to be $650. Works out to about $32, $33 worth of product per week. We are not doing different sizes. We've had a fair number of requests. We're just not willing to deal with that. Um, my partner and I both ran separate CSAs for a number of years. And at least with my customers, when I did sell a half share, the half share people or small share people would show up and look at the full share and there was just this unstated sense of inequity and disgruntlement. And so we urge people if they want to split a share to go find a friend to take it upon themselves to do that themselves. Um, as far as determining our share prices, I sit down with an Excel spreadsheet and do a lot of very painful cost calculation. You look at everything that's wholesale, we add up all of our costs, labor, trucking, advertising, shipping, storage, packaging, and total it all up. We figure in a certain percentage for profit, a certain percentage to cover all of our overhead, 
And so far the response we've gotten is that we could probably have pushed our prices a little bit higher. But we're also trying to maintain things and keep them, you know, keep the share accessible. Um, we do not purchase items from consignment or on consignment. We purchase them outright. And so we may move to kind of a pre-contracted model with some of our more regular vendors. But right now, if we have a vendor scheduled to show up and drop 50 dozen eggs on Wednesday afternoon, we have a check there waiting for them. So when they drop the invoice, they're paid on the spot. Um, we're not basically you know, taking credit terms to our vendors. We're paying them right up front. We're paying them on delivery. So those were a few questions I just answered real quick. Um, let's see. The interesting thing is that as far as our winter and our summer CSA members go, we're seeing a very big difference between the clientele. Um, I think we're getting more local wars or more a uh, higher percentage of people committed to buying local into our winter CSA. And that's because the bulk of them have summer vegetable gardens. They're doing a lot of processing, a lot of canning. There are a lot of my regular customers at the farmer's market, so they do a fair amount of gardening on their own. Um, my summer CSA members, we're still seeing an awful lot of people that um, first time CSA members, they like the idea of getting a half pint of pesto, a loaf of red hen bread, a dozen eggs, and then some produce. Um, we had very, very good feedback about the mix of the share contents this year. We were not experiencing um, what I call, you know, the walk of shame every Thursday on pickup day because your poor customer feels incredibly guilty that they didn't get around to cooking half the produce. It rotted and it went into the compost bin or worse. And so we're finding a lot of our customers want convenience. Um, they want to come in, pick up, have local, have it ready to go, but they just don't have the time to cook it. And so that's been working out. I guess we're really hitting on a niche market, so to speak. Um, I've got a question from Kristen regarding liability insurance. And right now, our CSA, we just incorporated for a subchapter S. And that subchapter S is going to have to go pick up a liability insurance policy separate from my farm and my partners. Um, as far as it covering other farmers' produce, I doubt it. But once we purchase that produce, we're effectively purchasing it for resale. So if we bring it in, ultimately I'm assuming we're distributing it so the liability falls with us. Um, another question from Anna is, do you calculate your labor on an hourly basis? Yeah, we roughly estimate it. We had somebody sit there and time themselves as far as how long it took to pack out 100 boxes. We have reusable, recyclable plastic boxes with our logo. Every customer gets two of them. They cost us about $10 a piece. We rotate those boxes through all season long. Customer returns the empty one. They take a full box. Um, some CSAs are basically avoiding all of that, and they, for lack of a better term, show up at the drop site, dump four or five bins of product, set it on the ground, and then what we see and the feedback we've gotten from a lot of their former customers is that if you're not there first, everything's picked over or mistakes are made or people take too much too little. Um, Basically, just you know, again, really low customer satisfaction. So what we're doing currently is each box is packed identically. The customer picks it up when they have time to get to it. They don't have to worry about getting the tail end of whatever is left over, um, so on and so forth. As far as what we're paying ourselves per hour, um, my partner and I have built in a profit margin, and that's what we're running with. Our labor rates are usually 10 to $12 an hour, basically, is what we're calculating. So, um, and then, let's 
see. I'm not sure what this is primarily my end of the CSA as I do a lot of winter production. And so as we roll into this winter, we'll be providing fresh spinach, fresh salad. And my partner, um, Dog River Farm, handles a lot more of the large scale commodity crops, potatoes, onions, carrots. And so this year we're scrambling a little bit because he was flooded out. So we're having to contract with other local growers to bring um, product in basically to cover, keep the CSA rolling. And we've basically started the CSA, so we've made a business decision, decision not to shut down or discontinue this year and take a break, but to push ahead with this winter and make it happen. And then Marcy wants to know how I calculate my retail markup on my off-farm products you're marketing. I'm not real clear on that question. It's, you know, if I go to the farmer's market, again, I sit down, what are the arm, other farmers, you know, basically pricing their product at, and the reality is, what's my cost of production? What do I need to make? I'm a two-acre farm, so I can't sell mescaline mix for 450 a pound like somebody who's farming mescaline on 50 acres can. There's just not the economies of scale. It's really, I think, that question, if you're, it's dependent on what your farm is capable of. Hey, Joe, uh, what, yep. I, I think that she might be asking with the, the products that you're buying in from other growers, are you marking those off as like a, a portion of the value of the share or is that just captured in um, the profit that you're, you're building in for you and George um, that might be a little bit closer to um, what she's asking, I think. Yeah. Are you buying okay. stuff at wholesale and then valuing it yeah. to the share? We're, we're actually buying in at above what the market wholesale price is. So our producers are getting a bit of a premium. They're basically getting some of the advantage of belonging to the CSA. But, and then we are turning around. And as far as our CSA customers go, it's being marked up to a point where it's still a little bit, say, 5 to 10 percent below what the actual retail is. And then somewhere in there, we have to keep track of our costs and figure out what our margin is. So it's, it's, we're trying to make this a win-win for everybody involved. Um, as far as delivering to community sites, schools, houses of worship, community centers, um, we're not there yet. This is more of a I guess a for-profit model. There's also an organization down here in Montpelier that's been around for quite a while. It's called Foodworks that has been running somewhat of more of a wholesale program that has gone to these other, you know, uh, you know, what are underserved sites, basically the public schools. I've been selling to this program for almost nine years, so um, we're not quite there yet. We're focused more on for-profit, large-scale institutional sites, at least for now. And then what we've also found is that some of the underserved sites, they, they need a lower price, basically. So we have one customer, Carol, actually, that is trying to get us into Montpelier Elementary School and round the teachers up and see if we can get five or six teachers in the school. So I guess, yes, we are kind of headed in that direction. So let's see. And I think kind of running out of, throwing a lot of stuff out there. So I want to leave something for Krista. <laughs> um, these are my winter greenhouses. So this is what we're harvesting during the winter months some seedling sheds, a few of my hens. Um, we are trying to produce our own eggs. Um, big egg shortage, if any of you want to get into egg production, never seems to be enough of the darn things. So I guess with that said, unless somebody's got some more questions out there, I'll turn this over to Krista for now. We'll go from there. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Joe, and uh, Joe will also um, be with us till the end here. So 
uh, we can uh, field some more questions. Um, and uh, we're going to advance. These are some more pretty pictures of uh, Joe and George's uh, farm. And now we're going to let Krista take over to talk about her CSA. Are you there, Krista? Yep, I'm here. Um, it sounds like you might want to mute the speakers on your computer because I'm hearing a little bit of an echo. Okay, hang on. Okay, how's that? Much better, thanks. All right. Okay, so we um, basically offer a year-round CSA that has a diversity of products um, most of which we produce ourselves. And so um, we're trying to offer a fairly broad diet through the CSA, uh, but there's some things we've chosen not to produce and not to buy in. Um, and so that's one of, I think, the key questions you'll kind of hear, uh, like between, you know, Joe's got a total different model where they're buying in a lot of stuff, um, doing some of the key production from two farms, but then buying from all these other producers. and on our end, we've decided kind of the opposite of like, okay, we want to produce as much of this as we can ourselves and still keep that, still keeps us profitable without stretching ourselves too thin and then buy in just a few key components to round out our share. Um, and so we, um, to give you a little bit of background, we have been farming for about 10 years and uh, produce on over 200 acres now, most of which is grazing land um, and the balance of which is uh, well, it's about um, 20, getting close to almost 20 acres now in vegetable production, some of which is in cover crop every year. So 20 acres tilled, but um, only about 10 to 15 at any given year in vegetable production. Um, and then the rest of that being grazing land. Um, the other thing that's unique about our farm is we don't own any of the land that we farm. We lease from about four different landowners in the, our community. Um, the cost of land in our area is um, quite astronomical in terms of if you want to use it for agricultural use. Um, even though there are some programs that make some farmland more accessible, um, they're far and few between the parcels that could become available. And so instead of putting um, a huge amount of our capital into purchasing land up front, we actually went uh, with working with all these different landowners. And though there are some drawbacks in the large picture, it works really well for us and also ties us into our community um, and kind of broadens our CSA reach in that way too. So I guess I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, so I'm going to just move through slides here so you can see a little of what we do. Um, so I encourage you to check out our website if you want to know a lot of the details about how our shares are structured and our pricing. It's all there. Um, and basically the overview of how we structure our program is um, we have three seasons. Uh, our summer season, which extends into, it goes from middle of June to the beginning of October. And then we have a uh, winter season that goes from the middle of October until the middle of February. And then a spring season, which goes from the end of February into the beginning of June. And the summer season is 17 weeks, and it's a weekly pickup. The winter and spring season are each eight pickups. It's an every other week. And, um, and so the, um, and there's a little bit of a tiny gap between summer and winter, um, like a well, it's basically a two-week gap. Um, the we kind of we've evolved into this. So we started with actually started with a winter share, um, which is a which we used to do as a once-a-month pickup, and immediately that first winter followed with a summer share. So we did winter summer for quite a while, and now we're in our um, about to start our third spring of offering the spring share. So just over the last two years have we done year-round production. Um, so we just started our winter share. And uh, this is our front page on our website right now. Um, and it just reminds me I need to change it. We just closed sign up because we are sold out. Um, so one of the hardest things about doing year-round production is the crop planning. Because it's not like you can sit down in January and plan your summer season and be done. Um, in January, you're already um, you're still you're still kind of working crops that are in your hoop houses from the winter. You have to get ready to start trans or start seeds in February so you can transplant into hoop houses in March. Um, <laughs> you might try to put stuff out early, like we did one year here, and um, got snowed in in early April. Not uncommon where we are. 
So, um, so that's another thing is the challenges of your own weather situation or climate situation. Um, and keeping really good records so you know how to accommodate for that and plan for it. And of course, you can't plan for everything, but um, I do keep really detailed records about uh, all my planting dates, different varieties, how they produce. I re we record all of our harvest with every harvest day so we know what our yields are, so we can actually say, oh, is it worth growing this variety or is it worth planting you know, bees on April 7th? Should I have just waited until you know, May 1st and would the crop have been just as good? Um, so there's, um, I can't stress enough the importance of crop planting as you move into, well, for any season, but especially as you move into um, multiple seasons. And so, for example, when I uh, am getting ready for my spring share of 2012, I am planning what I'm going to plant for that production in, um, in July. I'm actually planning for it in January of 2011, so I buy the seeds so I can plant all the root crops in July that I need to store all winter to distribute in spring of 2012. So we do have um, some pretty detailed Excel spreadsheets. That's where I track most of my crop planning. Um, and then I'll play a little bit more. We use QuickBooks to do actually all of our financial and uh, CSA member um, records. Um, to give you an idea of our setup, we use this for our on-farm pickups. So our pickups include um, on the farm, where probably about two thirds of our members pick up, and then we do um, a pickup at the Burlington Farmers Market, which we attend year round. It's a Saturday market. It's weekly through the summer, and then bi weekly through the winter and early spring. And um, we have made our basically our, our CSA seasons match up with the winter farmers market season um, for winter and spring so that the pickups occur on the farm and at the farmers market on the same day. That means we only have to mobilize the crops out of storage, you know, that w one day before. Um, it also means we only have to harvest from the hoop houses, you know, that one day before or two days before um, that Saturday. And um, so everything's coincided so that we're only moving crops around as little as possible, basically. Um, we do set everything out by the crop and have, you can see the little blue signs that are on the wall. It tells members how much to take. I think, I believe this looks like our spring season, um, probably in uh, uh, May. And um, we often will offer choices. Um, for example, um, like it looks like we put out, I don't know, beet greens and broccoli leaves and maybe there was chard in there or something too. And so we'll put out like similar types of greens and say, you know, take whichever bunch or number of bunches, you know, that you prefer, or we'll put out multiple types of crops, like or root crops, like carrots and beets and turnips and parsnips, and we'll say, you know, take three pounds total, and they can take whatever types of root crops they like. Um, that works pretty well for us, and you know, it all, you know, you just got to make sure it's all working out cost-wise, and uh, we do track um, what we put into the shares. We plan the shares in advance, so we know what value we plan to put into them, and then we actually keep track of what actually goes into them each pickup and we make adjustments as needed if we run short of a crop or something like that. We always guarantee our members a minimum of a 10% more than what they um, pay for their shares. So they always get a minimum 10% value in addition um, to what they've paid. Often, some seasons, especially like if we have bumper tomato crops or something, they often will get up to 25% more than what they've paid. Um, a big part of running a CSA um, for us is the celebration of our community and um, we do offer a, a fall potluck party kind of hangout time um, and every fall and then we also we used to do an open house in the spring um, or I'm sorry like a, a mini potluck sort of member orientation in the spring and now we've shifted it to an open house a farm open house um, and that partly part of the reason for that is because we realized like members would come to the farm for the pickup or they'd come to the farm for this celebration, but they never saw all the other places that we'd farmed. And you know the main farm where they come for the pickup is 25 acres, and they come up there and they don't even see like the huge fields of crops that are growing. They're like they're like where is all this food that you're growing? So now we do an open house so they can come and visit us at all the different sites, and we have maps and directions and basically a whole afternoon open where they can come to any of the or any or all of the fields. Uh, that we lease and come check everything out and see what we're doing. And um, not only the vegetables, but all the livestock as well. 
So um, I didn't cover that in detail, but we raised 100% grass-fed beef and lamb, pasture-raised pork and chicken and eggs um, from hens that are on pasture in the summer and in our hoop houses in the winter. Um, and then we produced a whole variety of vegetables. Um, this is a spring um, open house for the members where they're doing a tour. This was a long time ago um, before we had bigger fields than what is this area now. But anyway, this is one of our first years of a CSA. Um, but we always offer opportunities for our members to tour, um, learn, and um, in addition to our sort of spring and fall celebrations, we also do uh, member work days, which are totally voluntary. They don't, they're not required as part of the share, but like we'll set up, um, you know, like we have a wood-fired pizza oven now, so we'll like have a pizza party and clean garlic or, you know, or come harvest carrots and then eat pizza. So we try to tie it in with something fun. Um, and it's not required. It's just that they want to do it and check it out. They're welcome to come join us. Um, it is. It was a question, you know, I have often will have people ask me, well, can we do work shares? Um, and for certain people that, you know, I when I know they really want to do a consistent work component, I will make um, I, will, I will make an arrangement with them to do that, but we don't advertise it as something um, that we always do or are looking for, and um, and we also don't require our members to work. I actually did surveys the first five years, and most of the people said, you know, we really love the work that you do, and we're glad that you do it, and <laughs> we'd rather pay more for our share than do have be required to do work. So, <laughs> so we went with that. Um, it's just another example. This is summertime. Another example of the pickup. Uh, you can see here, for example, a choice between onions and leeks. Um, you know, it looks like near the end of the pickup day. We do. Oh, and this for sunflowers reminds me. We do have pick your own components as well in the uh, summertime, um, and a little bit in the spring for early herbs and such. But there's culinary herbs. There's flowers, um, and the summer share includes a weekly bouquet of flowers and whatever herbs they want to use. We have about 15 different herbs out there. And um, and then also they do some pick your own in the summertime. Uh, members uh, for the on-farm pickup pick their own cherry tomatoes and beans and peas. Um, and then the people who pick up off-site, um, we basically you know tell them the gardens are open to you. You can come at any time. You know, we, first time they come out, we show them where everything is. And then they can come out weekly and do the pick your own as well if they want to. Um, we communicate all that through an email that we send out weekly. It's a newsletter that serves our CSA members, but we've also broadened it to our whole mailing list. Um, so there's a recipe every week that's featured for some crop that we're bringing to market and putting in the CSA. And so we're hitting more than just our CSA members with all that email marketing. And um, touching on what Joe was saying about you know spam and you know the emails all get knocked out. Um, we've gone to MailChimp, which is like constant contact, and um, it allows um, you know the emails to get through people's spam filters most of the time. There's always a few exceptions, but um, we actually have a CSA member who trades us um, her email marketing expertise for shares, and that works great. We just feed her the information, she does all the formatting, she sends out all these newsletters, and um, it's a great relationship because you can't do it all. So this is reminding me to talk about diversification, and uh, we are very diversified. And um, the um, the downside of being diversified is you don't really become an expert in anything because you're doing so many different things. Um, there's, I guess, it depends on how big you get and how many people you can hire, but you can only <laughs> you can only work so many hours in the day. And so, um, you know, for us, it's been the biggest struggle is trying to find the right scale for our workload and our land capacity um, for all these different components. The plus side of diversification is um, people know they can come to you from a marketing standpoint. They know they can come to you and get all these different things, and they know that you can, um, you know, sort of verify and show them how all these things, different um, components, are raised on your farm or how they're grown, and um, and also, um, you know, it's. For us, um, we have the comfort of knowing what the quality of the products are that we're distributing through the share because we're producing almost all of them ourselves. And um, I'll get to the exceptions of the few things that we do buy in. Um, there's a question from Lucy about can um, what what it costs to lease on land per acre. 
in our area, uh, prime vegetable land that is like really good soils is about 100 to 125 dollars per acre uh, annually, and um, like grazing land, you know, more marginal land um, is more in the 40 to 50 dollars per acre range. Um, some of the landowners we work with, we um, just to get a little bit out that we have signed leases. We actually make and we make yearly payments. There's one landowner we work with that uh, doesn't charge us anything. We have no signed lease, and um, it's a handshake agreement. And we give them some meat every year, and it works out great. And um, you know, so it all depends on you. Really have to kind of know who you're working with and what your comfort level is, and you can make it as crazy and detailed and nitty-gritty as you want to, and it just really depends on um, the relationship you have with that landowner. Um, if you have any questions at all, you should do a written lease, um, even if you, um, just because if you, even if you all have the best intentions, just by going through the written lease procedure, you get all your questions answered, and all the issues come out on the table, and that's how it, you know, you really want to make sure you're doing that if you're going to be there for a long term. Um, so these are um, just to give you a little background on our pork production. We raise Berkshires and Tamworths. Um, they are on pasture uh, from basically once the pastures are dry enough in May until um, October, November, December. They stay outside even in the winter unless, like this um, sow, unless they're about to farrow, and we give them access to uh, to barn and, and hay and such uh, to uh, farrow. So we try to do most of our time most of our breeding so they're not farrowing in the dead of winter when it's the coldest. Um, if they are outside, even in the winter time, we have a whole bunch of big round bales out there and they basically make these huge nests out in the hay bales and um, that's where the term pig pile comes from because they literally do pig pile down in there. Uh, here's a picture of the flower garden from a couple years ago just to give you an idea and cherry tomatoes in the background there where they do their own new pick. Um, we usually have doesn't show everything. Usually, quite a bit more flowers than what you see there. But um, um, this is a setting. This is a farm stand on the left, and then um, the art gallery that my parents run is in the barn through the sliding glass doors that you see in the middle of the barn there. Um, and so, part of what people love about our farm is the setting. It's very, um, it's very relaxing. It's very beautiful there. And you know, there's this art gallery next door, which is kind of interesting for some people. And um, you know, it's just it's just a nice place to come to and hang out and get your share and walk through the gardens and see the animals. And so that's really important. Um, most of the people who, you know, select the on-farm pickup, they're not looking just for convenience. Um, they are looking for an experience. And they bring their kids and they bring, like, their food scraps and throw them to the chickens. And, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a fun thing for them to do. And um, there's a big sand pile with lots of... Um, Tonka trucks and things like that for the kids that don't want to pick flowers. So um, it's yeah, it's really neat, and it's neat for my kids too. I have two kids, and um, uh, the, the older one is six years old, and he's always really excited about CSA day. He wants to know when it's CSA pickup day because that means there's going to be 20 kids coming through that he can play with. Um, there's a question here from Madhu about: Do you think farming is worth it in Vermont for us New Americans? And um, I think Vermont is one of the best places to farm because the consumers are so ready. Um, you know, from the point that we started, um, there has been no problem in terms of finding a market for local food products. So I think Vermont is there's like there's like three or four places in the country that are just like so gung ho and moving so progressively and quickly with local agriculture, and Vermont's definitely one of those. So yeah. Come farm in Vermont. It's really cool. It's great. Um, see what else I got going here. So let's talk a little bit. I talked a little bit about spring or about year-round production. Um, this is an example of some spring crops coming out of our hoop houses. We do. There's a, there's a lot to learn basically about um, the winter and early spring production, and this is um, one of the most like challenging and interesting parts of farming for me right now. And that's one of the things I love about farming and running my own business is that I can go any direction I want with it, you know, as long as I determine that it's probably going to make me money before I launch, you know, way into it and keep me afloat, you know. But then there's just like so much you can learn. It's so interesting. And so I'm really 
psyched on all the winter growing. It's really fun and um, learning new things every year. And so um, there's just an example here of some crops. We transplant stallions, we transplant cilantro early in the spring. Um, you know, I've tried some of these things in the fall too, didn't work as well, or, you know, had the wrong planting date or whatever. And um, one example on the back wall of that hoop house there is Napa cabbage. And um, I'd be curious, Joe, if you've had any luck with this, but um, I can not get Napa cabbage to grow really early in the spring because if it ever gets any cold exposure, it bolts. And so you've got these crops that are, you know, biennials, and so you have to make sure you're giving them the right growing environments. And if they go through a real cold stress period, they don't want to form their, you know, first year head of cabbage or whatever they're supposed to do. They won't immediately want to go to seed. And so um, there's, uh, you know, a lot about the physiology of plants that you have to learn for your particular growing area and your climate. And I love that. It's really interesting to me. So talking about buying in a little bit more, um, we did a fruit share in the past uh, where we bought in. We don't produce fruit ourselves, so we bought in a lot of fruit from nearby growers and it was a really popular share but I found at the end of the year even though I did a markup on the product it was just too much hassle you know I was like every other week I had to connect with all these different growers sometimes I got a poor quality product but it was already delivered and it was the pickup was that day and I was like okay you know now what do I do I don't want this to like reflect on me and our farm you know and so um, so you have to think about all those things and and what works for you and what your comfort level is. And um, so, you know, it's like the first year we offered the fruit share, we did like 120 shares, you know, sold immediately. And I was just like, oh, wow, this is going to be great. And then at the end of the summer, I was like, gosh, I don't even know if it was worth that markup, you know. So, um, so there's uh, now what we've done is we've basically um, taken the fruit component and put it into what we call our settler vor share which is an add-on share. So we still buy a little bit of fruit in, but not as much <laughs> as we used to do with just a standalone fruit share. And I'll talk a little bit about our types of shares. So we have the three seasons, but we also have um, three sort of main share components, and you can mix and match what you want. Um, we have a vegetable share, um, a settler vor share, which is eggs, bread, cheese, and other add-on products um, like fruit or pickles or salsa which we make at the farm. Um, and then we have a meat share and a couple, we have two size meat shares. Um, and I'm just looking over, I'm checking in on questions to make sure I'm not missing anything here. Okay, fruit share markup. Um, so all the buy-in products, um, I basically do somewhere between a 30 and 40% markup, uh, which is standard produce markup at stores. So I basically say, well, I'm basically, you know, at this point, a store um, by buying in these products. And I might do a little bit less than that, you know, because um, it, it really just depends on the grower I'm buying from and, like, what level of wholesale they are doing. If they're a smaller grower and they're not doing a lot of wholesale, you know, we try to give them more of a premium, um, you know, and if, if something, if they have a really viable wholesale um, program already going and it works fine for them to, you know, stay at what the wholesale market rates are, um, you know, we just go with that. And um, and then we, we, we never sell the product for more than what those growers retail it for at their own places. So we try to, you know, we try to stay in what the retail market is for those products. Um, it looks like that's my last one. I was thinking I had another. So basically the other things we do for buying in are, um, are bread and cheese. And we have um, an off-site pickup at a bakery in Richmond, the town next to us, and we buy the bread from um, that bakery for our add-on in our shares. And so that's a nice relationship where, um, you know, they let us utilize their space for a pickup. We buy bread from them. Um, they actually buy eggs and greens and stuff from us. So it's, you know, it just keeps the food moving through the circles within our local community, and it's great. Um, and then we buy cheese from two local, well, they're, they're not right near us, but they're within Vermont, two Vermont farms. And uh, one of them is about 15, 20 minutes away, and the other one is about an hour away. Um, and uh, they're two very different types of cheeses. One's a goat cheese and one's a, um, an Ayrshire cow raw milk cheese. Um, and so it's really nice to have that diversity. We decided long ago never to get into dairy, um, never to... That wasn't an interest of ours or a branch we wanted to expand into. So we 
try to offer, um, you know, that cheese component. People have asked us to offer milk, and um, we can't, just because of the way the rules work in Vermont, we can't offer raw milk um, if we were to sell it, but if we basically just were like a site for a raw milk dairy to drop milk, I think there's a way we can make that work. But uh, we're just starting to explore that and see if there's enough interest to, to make that viable for a raw milk dairy to be, be involved in. Um, just looking, uh, so one thing I want to stress, like, in addition to the CSA, we also sell wholesale and retail at our farm stand and farmer's market, and um, we wholesale to stores and restaurants in the area. But our CSA is our top priority. They're our best customers. They're putting, um, you know, a significant amount of their food dollars into our farm. And um, so whenever we have to pick and choose between where product is going, our CSA always gets our top priority. That said, over the years, as we've become better growers and more efficient growers, um, you know, we really strive to overproduce a little bit all the time, and that gives us a little more flexibility and a lot less stress in terms of meeting our CSA share obligations. Um, we, the year round, when we started launching into the year round, um, you know, one of the main questions we had to ask ourselves was, do we really want to, uh, you know, become a, a farm that never gets a break. <laughs> and you really have to ask yourself that question because some people love having the winter off or this whatever season it is you take off. And um and for us, you know, we were doing a lot of the livestock production already through the winter. So we're like, well we're here. We're pretty much locked in. So why don't we just keep going and do more vegetables and make it make it a, a year round thing. And so um as we've gotten a little bit bigger and hired more employees we have found that our flexibility and our time off comes with having a really great crew where we can actually leave the farm for two weeks and they can keep things going. And so that's our, um, you know, we're just getting there. And um, I think even this year was another breakthrough in terms of having really top-notch staff. And so that's a lot of our focus is, you know, becoming better employers and, and hiring really good employees so that we can have a, a crew to um, sustain the farm when we have to or when we want to be able away for a little while. Um, by going year round also, instead of like for a while we toyed with the idea of making our CSA membership bigger in the summer. And then we said, you know, we've already got like this core group of a hundred plus people. Um, or I would say from year to year it's a core group of like seventy to eighty people and then we always have new people moving coming in and other people going out. Um, you know, let's sell more to those people rather than trying to like double our customer base. Um, so by adding the year-round production, we kept these core group of people with us longer and they're buying more from us. We do offer incentives for them to purchase shares in all three seasons and we offer incentives for them to purchase more types of shares within any given season, um, being the vegetables, the meat, and the settler for a share. Um, when you want me to stop, Jesse? Um, <laughs> thank you very much. I think um, there's some some more questions, and I want to pull uh, Joe and Jean back onto the line here, um, and maybe just address. Um, uh, there's some questions about employees. Um, how many employees you guys are working with over the seasons, um, and uh, also. I think since both of you are working with diverse um, markets, uh, you know, whether you'd ever consider going, you know, 100% to the CSA or whether you find value in having diverse markets, does that allow you to move product um, more efficiently? Uh, yeah, so maybe you could address, you guys could each address those two questions. And anybody else out there who has more questions, um, uh, please type them into the chat box here while we have this. We'll do this for about another 10 minutes or so, and then we'll wrap up. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll just give you a break, Chris. I've been sitting here recovering for a little while. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, my farm is fairly small. I run it uh, with two full-time employees this year. They're on the books. All that stuff is on board. All the all those painful tax payments every month. Um, 
And then during the winter months, I'll probably stay with one full-time employee or almost full-time employee through this winter. But again, it's because of the CSA. I've actually, the last seven or eight months, have been getting rid of most of my wholesale accounts. I'm moving away from it. And again, with the volume that my farm does, moving into value-added product, focusing on the CSA, um, I'm trying to get to a point where I'm doing one farmer's market a week and one CSA pickup a week, and that's it. Uh, I was a restaurant owner for many years before I got into farming, and I was that pain in the rump customer, and now I'm on the other end of it, and I just, you know, the wholesale accounts, I just don't want to deal with them anymore. So I'm trying to move out of that. Yeah, we, um, we, we enjoy, well, the farmer's market um, component we find crucial to our marketing because um, we pick up customers there, basically. Yeah. And a lot of those people become CSA members. There's, you know, not a lot of them, but some of them become CSA members. Um, and then in terms of the other wholesale accounts um, and how we kind of work those, and I think a there's we definitely we don't like try to go and sell to every restaurant in Burlington um or every store in Burlington that buys local. We basically have picked out a key group of like six that work really well for us, and we just try to sell a lot of different things to those six accounts rather than trying to sell you know mescaline to twenty accounts. We're trying to sell you know mescaline beef, pork, lamb, chicken, and forty other vegetables to six accounts um and eggs and so that works really well for us and we only really want to work with wholesale accounts who are willing or interested in putting our name into the public face as well. And so the names on, you know, the board at the restaurant or on the menu or, you know, our labels are on the meat at the healthy, you know, healthy living market or whatever. So they, the customer knows where that food is coming from and they can tie it back to our name or our face or our logo. Um, and so that's, for us, that's um, how we have focused our wholesale components. Um, that said, I don't wholesale everything. There's certain vegetables I will never wholesale because I cannot produce them efficiently enough to make it more cost effective at a wholesale price. Um, so we definitely pick and choose which um, components go into our wholesale accounts. Um, in terms of employees, we have the equivalent of uh, eight full-time during the summer, though there's more than eight people because some of them are part-timers. Um, my husband and I are full-time. And um, and then we have two other full-time employees that stick with us year-round. So there's four full-time year-round, and then um, several. And, and when I say like the others are seasonal, their season is March through Thanksgiving, so it's a really long season. Um, but yeah, we bring on another, um, you know, six or so people from March through November. Um, and as you you know, that for me that's one of the hardest parts is has been learning to become a good employer and manage people well and um it's definitely a key component to uh, to making the business run smoothly. Yeah. Uh, so there's a, a few questions just about production. One is um and this might uh Joe you had a, a veggie CSA on your own as well so maybe you have some input on this, but how many uh, veggie shares you produce per acre. I know a lot of new growers are often wondering, you know, how many shares can they support on the number of acres that they have available to them. And then yeah. also what crops um, you recommend, um, you know, what are efficient and um, a, a good investment uh, of your time? Well, I mean, it depends on what you're doing with your CSA as far as what you're going to produce per acre. I mean, if I'm making fresh tomato sauce and handing that out to my CSA customers, um, you know, that's a, that's a tough question. I mean, I guess a few years back I had a 30-member CSA and I had one 30 by 100 foot greenhouse set up and I was farming maybe I don't know, another acre. And the problem, you know, to answer Amanda's question is, you know, as you enter the CSA market, what crops would you recommend? What is the most efficient? To be honest, that's really 
it is a consideration, but the reality is is that your customers are signing up to get the equivalent of a grocery store at a certain level. So whether it's efficient or not, whether a cantaloupe make you money or not, you may have to grow them. People want variety. You can't hand them, you know, tomatoes and lettuce every week and expect them to be happy, you know, and to return the following year. And so I think at some point I had 75 different vegetable crops going at a certain point during the summer just to keep things cranking constantly. Um, yeah, I think that's a really good point, Joe. And I, I think where the efficiency comes in is in some of the details of um, seasonality and things like that. For example, I don't try to grow spinach in August. Um, yeah. Because nine times out of ten, it's too hot and my seedings fail. And it's like, why am I killing myself to grow spinach in August? I can grow really good spinach in September and October. So, you know, that, absolutely. There's things like that that you know. And the other thing, like, um, yeah, I'm like greens. People always want greens, and you know, I was finding like the cost of the share was crazy if I was putting all these cut greens in all the time. And so I said, all right, yep. I'm going to grow a whole bunch of head lettuce for people, and they're always going to have head lettuce, and then they're going to get the cut greens like every you know scattered here and there, not every pickup. And people were really happy with that. They're like, okay, I can make my salad all the time. And, you know, once in a while we get a surprise of mescaline or arugula or whatever. And, you know, but they felt like consistently they had greens. Um, and it was a yeah. lot more cost effective for me. So there's all those little things you can kind of tweak. And um, there's certain things maybe you shouldn't grow. Like I didn't grow sweet corn for the first five years of our CSA because I didn't have the land base and I didn't need to grow enough of it to be efficient at it. And so I just bought um, organic sweet corn from a neighbor who was growing it, and I was like, that works. Yeah. And people were fine with that. You know, we labeled it from such and such a farm, and, um, you know, everyone was like, it's cool. <laughs> so you just have to, uh, you know, figure out what works, um, you know, for your, your soil types, all those things. I mean, there's so many things. Like some people, like, say, oh, I'm not going to grow carrots because, you know, i got clay soil or whatever. I can't grow carrots. You know, you just have to figure out what works best for your soils. And I think, you know, the situation you have, Joe, you can, those farmers can focus on what they do best and grow yeah. more of those things. Yeah, and this is Jean, if I can just jump in um, to address that and also Carol's additional question of how much diversity is needed. I, I think, um, you know, it's really powerful to actually talk to your customers and do a, a share evaluation with your customers each year and find out what it is that's a priority to them. And, um, you know, it's, it's good to not ask them if they want things that you can't grow or provide, but to think about kind of what your ideal situation is and then see how they would respond to that. Um, you know, it, it's really great to just keep in touch with your customers in that way. Yeah, and, and, and if there is something you're not growing, um, explain to them why. You know, a lot of people are something like, oh, why don't you grow celery? You know, and I'm like, well, mm. celery is like, you know, a 190-day crop or whatever it is. You know, I was like, yes, some people do grow celery in Vermont, but I was like, it's really not cost effective for that one crop, you know. And so we don't grow celery. They're like, okay, you know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and that's the, the bigger thing is that, you really need to solicit membership feedback um, during your season, at the end of the season. Um, I've had a lot of customers this winter, you know, that I'm either lactose intolerant or I, I can't eat wheat, or are you willing to substitute something for my wheat? Um, I had one person, you know, am I going to get eggplant every week? Because if you give me eggplant every week, I'll scream at you and quit. And, you know, you really want to feel people out, but above all else, be honest right up front. You know, I don't grow carrots because I have sandy soil and soil nematodes, and I can't get rid of them. But we're going to buy some in, so I may offer them twice during the summer months. And then ultimately let the member make that decision before you collect the check from them. You want to communicate with them as much as you can up front, answer as many of their questions before they buy in. I think is a, is a critical piece. Yeah, and one thing we strive to do is um, at each pickup we try to have a minimum of eight different things and um, and not like eight different brassicas, like eight different kind of vegetable families roughly represented. I mean, there will be some overlap between families, but, you know, in general. Um, 
and eight's the minimum. And so even in the spring and even in the depth of February, you know, we've got eight different things out there at a minimum. And a lot of times it's yeah. 15 different things. Um, but people don't want, like, a little bit of 15 different things. They'd rather have, you know, a good workable amount of eight things that they can make, you know, a whole week's worth of meals out of. But, you know, they don't want just, like, you know, a quarter pound of broccoli and, you know, I don't know, one yeah. tiny eggplant. You know, they'd rather have five um, Asian type eggplant. They can make an eggplant meal out of that week and then not get eggplant again for a month. You know, that's, I think, what I have found anyway from members feedback work, works better. Yeah. So Lucy just posted a question, you know, trying to figure out how much to grow for 15 to 20 CSA members. Um, there's a number of ways to go about that. I mean, figure out you know, how much income you want the CSA to generate, you know, divide that by 20, divide that, you know, figure out how many weeks you're going to make a delivery. So now all of a sudden you're going to start being able to attach a dollar amount that you need to produce per person each week. And then at that point you've got to start looking at wholesale and retail pricing. Then you get your seed catalog out and start looking at planting dates and yield per row foot and so on and so forth and seeding densities. There's a lot of, you know, paperwork involved. Or you can just fly by the seed of your pants and <laughs> try and grow everything and hope you got enough. Oh, no, no. <laughs> Flying by the seed of your pants does not work too well. <laughs> no, no, you definitely – and here's the other thing I'd recommend is if you are a new grower in – don't have many growing seasons behind you yet, um, I would not recommend jumping into a CSA right from the get-go. Um, yeah. That's my personal opinion, but um, I would recommend... I agree with that. Yeah. I'd recommend, you know, a roadside stand or if you have the traffic for that or farmer's markets um, or even just a few small wholesale accounts just to, you know, get get going, get efficient, um, learn about how some of these crops grow. Learn what kind of yields you can get off of them, um, and uh, and you know, and keep those records for those first couple of years. Well, forever, but definitely start right from the first couple of years. And and then you know, if you do decide like your first or second year, um, you know, especially if you've worked on a lot of other farms and you have a lot of experience already, you're ready to jump right in and you're going to start a CSA. Um, you know, I would like. I would definitely like plan out the whole share for this season and um, take your best guess at what yield you're going to get off of X amount of bed feed of broccoli or whatever it is, and then grow another 20% on top of that. Um, because worst case scenario, you have too much and you just you need to wholesale a little bit, and you probably can you know, move a little bit here and there if you need to into wholesale accounts. I mean, it depends on where you are, I guess. But I know in Vermont, if you had to move, of stuff, you know, every other week or something, it wouldn't be a problem. Um, and just to add on to that real quick is that contrary to what a CSA model is supposed to be, in other words, if you're having a poor year or you come up short, that your customers are buying into that risk and they're going to understand. And the reality is they don't really. A great, well, not all of them, but a great majority of them. They've prepaid for something and so they're expecting something every week. You've really got to hit a certain consistency level with everything, I think, especially if you want to see repeat customers year after year. Yeah, the other thing I've seen other farms do, like if you end up overproducing, like the one thing you don't want to do is throw too much food in the share because Joe mentioned that like, people feel horrible if they end up composting it. Um, and then they say, oh, I can't use this share. I'm not going to buy it next year. It's too much. Um, so, you know, stick with your plan of how much you think you know, works for the volume, the quantity that you're going to give per week. And then, you know, if you have a bumper crop of broccoli or something, you can offer them on the side um, as a, like a wholesale rate. So you can say buy a crate of broccoli for freezing and offer it to your members at wholesale prices. If you don't want to go find wholesale accounts, you can wholesale it to your members. And there's going to be some that will take you up on, oh, yeah, I want to freeze a bunch of broccoli for the winter or whatever. Um, that's another way to move surplus without making members feel like they have to take it. Um, I know that sounds weird because you think, oh, I grew all this, I have a good crop of this, I should give it to my members, that's what they bought into. It's like, yes, but to a point, you know. Um, or if you don't feel it's right to sell it to them, you could just put, again, just put it to the side and say, extra broccoli, take it if you want it. But 
you know, don't like require them to take it. And I know, I am, you know, you might say, well, no one's ever required to take anything, but they feel like they are. <laughs> if it's in the lineup and there's a sign that says take three heads of broccoli, they're like, oh my god, I have to take three heads of broccoli. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. Yeah, and I would just add that um, I think those are great ideas, Krista, but um, to be careful in your marketing, you know, if you're really coming on heavy with the shared risk, shared bounty concept, I've I've heard some feedback from customers who were sort of disappointed when their farmer then came out and said, we had a bumper crop of tomatoes, feel free to buy it, you know, and they sort of felt like, yeah. just, and that's yeah. a shared bounty right. part. Oh. Right. Well, that's why I said, you know, if you're not comfortable buying it, like selling it, then okay. just, but I think it is important to like, separate sometimes sometimes to separate that bounty out to the side so that people don't feel obligated to take it. Totally, yes. Yeah. I agree. Um a lot of times like we'll sell our second quality. So like if we have second tomatoes, you know, we put lots of first tomatoes into the share and there's and there's plenty to eat, you know, and get them through a week's worth of their share. But then some people want to can them and freeze them and stuff, but not everybody wants to do that. So we'll just sell seconds um as in you know, like bushels or whatever for people to can. But. So um, we are out of time, um, and I want to thank um, you guys tremendously for taking time this evening. Um, you guys are year-round producers, and Jean is a full-time dedicated nonprofit employee, and uh, thanks for taking the time in the evening to share all this great information with us. Um, and I also wanted to say to everybody who's on Align with us that uh, I'd be happy to send out some uh, follow-up information about CSAs and also some resources for enterprise budgets and crop planning um, enterprise sheets that are online uh, that might help you out in figuring out how to figure out your CSA share. So uh, go ahead and put your email into the chat box if you'd like to receive that kind of information. Um, and I will get that out to you. It's looking like probably next week. <laughs> um, and thanks again. Um, and I hope that you all have a very good evening. Thank you. Thanks again. Good thanks luck, everybody. everybody.